God is not religious. This is part one. Y'all, you can get on the edge of your seat and it'll hit me a lot. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, they brought this guy to Jesus who was crippled. And they asked him, you know, and Jesus said, uh, your sins are forgiven you, which is kind of an odd thing to say when he's crippled and on a bed, right? But then the Pharisees said within their heart, who is this man who thinks he can forgive sin? And then Jesus, knowing their thoughts, this is one thing, don't be thinking around Jesus, because he's going he gonna to know exactly what you're thinking. You might as well go ahead and say it, right? And Jesus turned to them and says, well, let me ask this, which is each for me to say your sins are forgiven for or to rise up and take your bed and walk. And what I noticed in this encounter is they did not answer because they did not know. Because Jesus was setting them up. Which is easier? The answer is neither. The same word that forgives your sin heals your body. Yeah. There's no compartmentalization in God. The next page in, in uh, Romans chapter 10 and 13 says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody say saved. Saved. Well, we, we understand that that means that, that means we pass from death into life, right? Well, the, the word saved in the Greek language is the word sozo. And it means this. Saved, healed, delivered, and protected. It means all of that. It doesn't mean just a part of it. It means every bit of that. That means you're just as saved as you're healed. You're just as delivered as you're protected. You can't escape those things. If you come in contact with Jesus Christ, you've gotten the whole thing. But how much of it do we experience or, or, or appreciate? Only the part that we get the revelation about. Right? Okay. Next page. Ooh. In the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, I mean, it's not going to be political, just my wife is. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. How do we take that and get separation of church and state? Oh, yeah. I don't even say that. In, in, in fact, this place is, here's, what, here's what happened. The original framers of the Constitution were not trying to keep God out of government. They were trying to keep government out of God. Amen. Everyone knew that these men, the people that knew these men, had no trouble discerning this. But when people simply read the letter of the law without factoring in the spirit of the law, the original intent, intent is lost in translation. You can't just read the words without knowing the one that wrote it. Or you'll, you'll get it all screwed up in your interpretation. That's where religion comes from. Religion comes from man trying to interpret what God is saying without knowing him. That's good. That's good. Matthew 9, he told the Pharisees, he said, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Why did he say that to the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees had taken the Ten Commandments and they had written volumes of laws based on those Ten Commandments. Stuff like, one of them was, it says you keep the Sabbath holy. That means that, that you can only do work for so long on the Sabbath. And they, then they broke that down into how many steps you could take in a day. And then if you'd gotten to the end of your steps, you had to sit down until nightfall. <laughs> when, they, when they read where it says, keep the word before you, they have a box of scripture in front of their face. They didn't even see the wall. They used to call them bloody heads because they were already taking their head and stuff. This means that God puts me on the ground of mercy and not sacrifice. This means that God would rather show mercy, rather us show mercy, rather us love people, rather us act like we're from heaven and have the same heart as Jesus and go through our religious activity, read our Bible every day, pray every day, you know, know how to put our scripture. No, that's important. If we're not doing that, have the mercy on to make any sense. We can all learn how to be Christians. But what's, what's the work of so much to teach you? Uh, He'd rather have something for mercy than a sacrament. When they brought the woman caught in adultery, the, the Pharisees had caught her in the act of adultery. 
She was guilty of sin. They dragged her body before Jesus, and I'm just thinking, you know, hey, y'all are probably watching this, which is a big example to participate, but we won't go there. And they said, no, they both the father, they saw her in their death. What do you say? Jesus didn't say. He just said, that's her right. <laughs> and said, one by one, they dropped their rock, began with the oldest to the youngest, and they went away. And then Jesus looked at this woman and he was getting to Rod's car and said, You have to tell us what are you going on? And he looked at him and said, Where are your kids? He said, No. He said, No. You know what got you? He didn't replay her past. He didn't, he didn't rock with her everything that you're not clean and unworthy. He just said, hey, you know what? This is been all that off. If it wasn't here to serve a sacrifice, I'm here to show mercy. It means that he'd rather forgive than punish. He'd rather us live our lives to demonstrate our love for him than us to be good long. Yes, sir. In Exodus 40, the Ten Commandments came down. The finger of God wrote the law on the stone, and Moses brought down the mountain. <laughs> and in that book of law, in those Ten Commandments, he said, Don't tell them I'm kidding. So we had that picked up. You know, I, I can beat you as long as, long as I don't, you know, you stop breathing pretty good, right? As long as I don't actually kill you. <laughs> and so we've got to figure out how we can, we can surf around the law. And this is how we do it a lot. Because we figure out, because they're not always good at me. It's like, if you're ready to ask me, you already know. Because see, God didn't come to run on stone. He came to run on yeah. And so the genius, we had this, that's said, don't kill, that's said, not committed, don't you're going to steal. And not figure it out. Then Jesus comes along and just messed it up. Because then Mark's gone and he said, you know what? You've heard of sin and all, but you shall not hurt it. Let me tell you this. If you need to call that, you've heard of it. Well, that's great. I've been going to all those anger management classes, and I've got my kids down to like five a year, and here he comes along. It says, even if I talk to him in the heart, what did he say? He's trying to tell us, look. Laws, ritual, will not be because what you need has to happen on the inside. You learn all about it. You study the five books of Moses and come in from here, but that way you should be closer to the kingdom than, than you are when you start. Now, those are great exercises, and if you want to learn the Bible, that's awesome. But don't think that your activity is getting you closer to God. That's it. He said, yeah, it, it just, it's just like you're in danger of judgment when you actually kill them. That's not judgment. That's not judgment. How does that work? Because we can see already. Your actions are only a product of what your mind is conceived. It's already a lot of a rough kick. You're just acting out. You understand what I'm saying? Thanks for that. In 2 Corinthians 3, y'all get the edge? I'm just looking here now. I'm here. So he also in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4, 6, he says, You also made a sufficient guest of the new covenant. That's the new covenant. New covenant. Not in the letter, but in the spirit. Now I'm explaining this. See, the, the letter kills, and the spirit gives life. Now, why is this important? Because I don't know how you guys are, but ever since I got born again, I just keep resist sliding back over into the law again. When I got saved, I was so thankful that Jesus. I was unworthy of it. The joy of the Lord filled my heart. And then I started reading the Bible. Then I started reading the Bible. I started reading that other people in the Bible. And they started trying to impose their rules on me. The next thing you know, I'm trying to please the dead. Right. Oh, come on, man. Yeah. Instead of what we I remember the first time I blew it as a Christian. I laid on the floor and wept for a whole day. It wasn't because of the big program to do something. But ever since that time, we, we're looking for lists and programs. You can click on this. I don't, the 
prayer of Jacob is whatever else we can do to show up the circle of actually knowing him. Next time. Religious ignoring of the ability to put on the couch is the end. Religious practices that do not serve God's ultimate purpose serve no purpose. It's good that you can pray for Borg. You can pray for Borg so you can say that you pray for Borg. If you read through your Bible and you hear this also, we don't do it so you can say that you're going to pray for Borg. Read through your Bible so you can get close to but if you understand what I'm doing here, because right now, this world, if you were you said we're a Christian, they see those guys holding up a sign telling everybody they got hates them. That's the definition they got in their heart. And if we're gonna win this world, we're gonna turn it around and come out. We're gonna show them the people it's not driven by rules, regulations, and practices, but that I know if people have to leave. If you want to meet you can find them right here in the that makes sense. Mark chapter 7 is what he told the Christian. He said, You make the word of God no effect. Wow. Through your tradition. Let me say that again. Let me tell you how it is in the character of the church. That last time we did it, I couldn't get it done by this Friday. We'll do it for another six months. They can be regenerated that same moment, right? That's how we do it. We're, we're just. We're to those kind of things who want to retain one in Egypt, one in the complaint in the wilderness. They're free. It's just they didn't know what they were doing anymore. Yeah. Well, they were slaves in Egypt. It's safer. It's yeah. easier. To trust God is the only thing we can do. You're free. You're delivered. But you're not in charge. You make the word of God of no effect. Now think about that for just one second. I'm, I'm flirting with the idea. I'm getting so old now that it's like, <coughs> you know, three fast ones and three slow ones, some funny slides and a 30-minute message. Is that really what we're here to do? Or is it to come here one time and just... Let the Holy Spirit loose, do something in us, send us out of here. One Sunday we'll, we'll meet here, we'll go find some struggling church, and we'll go sit there and support that pastor. He's ready to quit, and somebody come in there. You never know what difference it makes when somebody's amening you and pulling it out of you. Why, it just energizes you. I'm just saying, maybe we should get in, in the business of, of just seeking those that are lost, those that need saving. Maybe it's just me. Matthew 22. 37 and 40 through 40. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is the most incredible statement to me in the new covenant. He said, on these two things, you can take the whole law and covenant, the whole law and the prophets and condense it down to these two rules. You could tear the front half of your Bible out, if you will, and say what he was saying was is for me to love him with all my heart and to love my neighbor just like I love myself. That's the message. So no matter what else you're getting from God, if it doesn't line up with that, it's the devil. He's for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He's not here to condemn you because it's kind of like he's finally, he's finally been talking to me. It's like, man, I tell you, my, my life every day is different. Every day is different. To, to try to get a schedule for me is ridiculous. And I start getting beat up by that because I know people that they have such a rigid, perfect schedule and I look at them and I'm condemned that I don't. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, hey, won't you just hang out with me when you can? Kind of like I would do with anybody else that I love. You know, you know and, and this is the thing that I, I felt this on the way this morning. Sherry and I tell each other we love each other all the time. We've taught our kids. They say, love, love you. It freaks Stephen out in the beginning because he's from up north. What do you mean you love that guy? Well, we just love everybody. That's how we do. So he, now he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but to say that is different than when I look her in the eye and say, I love you. And I don't know where my life would be without you. 
And I'm saying that sometimes we can just pray of our meals and, and walk our track and we get, we, we're mindful of Him, but we're not connecting with Him. And sometimes this stuff that we do, we equate it with some sort of spiritual growth, but it becomes a bag of sand around our shoulders because we're doing a work that's not producing any fruit. And so after a while, you get to where you, I don't want to go pray. I don't want to open my Bible because I'm just not doing it. Maybe it's just me. And I'm suddenly realizing if he's a real person and he lives inside of me, I'm never away from him. I can talk to him all the time. I can laugh with him. I can cry with him. Whatever I want to do, we're inseparable. And so I don't, have to, I don't have to separate an activity to say that's God. I'm God wherever I go. Now, I'm not saying don't read your Bible. I'm not saying don't pray. But there's people that have been taught their life. If they don't, do, if they don't read you know, six chapters a day, they're going to hell. <coughs> I'm glad that you opened it at all. But I'm saying be driven by a desire to know him and not just be religious. Yes. Amen. Next page. Matthew 5, 48, he said, therefore you shall be perfect. Oh, here we go. Dang it. As soon as I get my little liberated thing here, then he comes along and says something like that. Be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I got news for you. You want to cure that uh, OCD? Yeah, build a house. Right? Nothing's square. Nothing's straight. Nothing's level. It'll drive you berserk until you get over yourself. How is it that I can be perfect? If you want to translate the word in no way, it says complete. How can I be complete? Well, in my mind, I'm thinking I can't ever make a mistake. Anybody ever been driven by that? One mistake. Listen, I, I was freaking out because I had passed some of this on to my children genetically. Taylor was this tall, and I gave her a piece of paper to color on, and she made a marker, and she handed it back and said, I want another page. I made a mistake. I said, I didn't do that. It's not my fault. <laughs> What's the cure? What, how can I be perfect? Because even if I'm perfect today, I'm not going to be tomorrow. Some of us live under the, the, the bondage of if, making sure everybody likes us. They may like you today, but there'll be five more people tomorrow. And, and try this job. There's a hundred reasons why everybody came. There's only one reason everybody leaves. Me. That's okay. What does perfect mean? In the, in the Greek language, it means that I'm aimed at the final goal. Well, I can handle that, can't you? Because yeah. if I keep my eyes on where I'm going, I may fall over in this ditch. But I can get back up and I can still be aimed at where I'm going. I may fall over here, fall flat on my face, fall backwards and have to make up ground. Don't make no difference. I've got my eyes on where I'm going. I've got my eyes on who I am. I've got on, I've already, he's, come, he's telling me every day who I really am. So it doesn't matter what I'm doing on the earth. I'm already seated with him in heavenly places. Put your hand on your chest and say, I'm aimed. Bang. At the final goal. Doesn't that feel better? Doesn't that feel better than, than weighing yourself every day upon your accomplishments and your actions and seeing whether you, you're worthy or not or match up so that I can pray harder and believe harder? I, you know what? If God does anything, it's because He said He's going to do it. It's not because I made Him do it. <laughs> what a fallacy. How stupid are we to think that, oh, I, but I said it ten, ten times. Uh -huh. That's right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I said it five times a day, and that's what made it happen. Now, he said it first, and we just repeated it. <laughs> Y'all hear me this morning? Next page. Well, here's the reason I'm saying all this. The Lord spoke to me, I believe, as clearly as, as anything, and he said these two words they're coming. Just what you said in your word. They're coming. And when the Gentiles came on the, on the Jews that were Christians, it freaked them out. Because they, like, they weren't from around here. 
And they had all them weird practices over there, all that idolatry and all that other stuff. They're going to come to the kingdom. Here's what we're doing. They finally settled on the Gentiles. Here's what you guys do. If you're going to be part of our little club, then I want you to abstain from uh, things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Really? Show me where Jesus said that to them. He didn't say any of that to them. They were so freaked out that they were different, they added a little bit to the to grace. And you know we've been doing that ever since. Got to be baptized, really? Can't smoke, can't chew, can't whatever, right? Dottie's heard that a thousand times. Can't smoke, can't chew, can't run with those that do. That's right. And those are great habits. Don't get me wrong. To, to avoid those things, that's awesome. But none of that gets you to heaven. That's right. Yeah. And we're judging people based upon their activity and we're letting them know that those things are what's keeping you from God. Those aren't the things keeping you from God. You're not in Him. That's why you're not in God. You don't know Him. That's what's keeping you from God. You haven't asked Him to come in. That's the only thing you've got to do. Let Him do the rest. You invite him in, he'll fix everything he wants to fix, and you can tell everybody else to butt a stump. Am I speaking to the right crowd this morning? Yes. Next page. Here's what Paul wrote to the, to the Galatians. King James says, I do not set aside or frustrate, but in the Greek language it literally means this. I do not invalidate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, any law, mm -hmm. you know, we tell people all these things that they need to do. Well, yeah, you need to do those, but let me ask you this. If I don't do those things, am I going to go to heaven? No. Because not doing things doesn't get you to heaven as much as doing things get you in hell. That's right. It's how you were born in this earth. You came into the world in sin, separated from God. The only way to get back to Him is to invite Jesus to come in, wash and cleanse you, and change you from within. That's how it works. Then when I decide to quit something or do something, it's because He's telling me to do it, not because you're pressuring me into it with your religion. Do not invalidate, invalidate the grace of God for if righteousness comes to the law, then Christ died for nothing. for nothing for nothing if i could not drink caffeine and 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 all these other rules you can put on yourself and that gets me to heaven then why did jesus get up out of his seat we could have just we could have just lawed ourselves up to him but the problem was that we couldn't get to him no matter what we did we couldn't get to him even those jesus told those guys they said we're children of abraham and you try to instruct us and jesus then said there's nobody as blind as those that won't see it don't matter who you were born to. I don't care who your daddy is on earth. <laughs> That's the first question to ask you when you come to Hartsville. Who are your folks? Yeah, we're proud of nothing here, buddy. <laughs> I bet that made you mad, didn't it? All right. <laughs> Next page. In Colossians 1, 12, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. Inheritance. Of the saints in life. You know, I didn't realize how much that word is in the New Testament. And how much it's, in, it's associated with, with verses that we quote all the time. But I've never noticed it. 18 times alone in the New Testament when it talks about what Jesus has done for us and how he's redeemed us, set us free, healed us. It has the word inheritance in there. And so it jumped up and caught my eye, and I thought, you know what? What is my inheritance? What's the abundant life, right? It's, it, it's, it's our citizenship. Jesus paid a price so that we could be joint heirs with Him, seated with Him in heavenly places, with all power and authority. That's all power and authority. That's my inheritance. But what's His inheritance? In Psalm chapter 2, this is written, and I know now that we're one with Him. Get it? Look at me. I get it. But the time this was written, it was to Jesus and Jesus alone. He says, I, he's talking to his, his only begotten. And here's what He tells Him. I will declare and decree the Lord has said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I'll give you 
the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. My question is, if our inheritance is the life he's given us, and if he paid the price to give us that inheritance, shouldn't we pay the price to give him his? It's our job to ask for the nations because that's his inheritance. And so often we focus on what he's done for us, and that's great. But I want to tell you something. We're not here. What are we doing here if all we're here to do is just live good lives? Right. Now, we're here to reap a harvest. We're here on a search and rescue mission to seek out those that will be saved and pull them on the boat before the thing takes off. And to have an urgency. And, and maybe, I don't know if this is reaching you like it did me, but suddenly I realized, you know what, this is, my life's always been all about me. Maybe just for a little while I can focus on what he wants. And no, every decision I make be about how's this going to impact my ability to reach the nations. Next page. In John chapter 4. This is my last scripture. Jesus is talking to his disciples 2,000 years ago. And he said, don't say to me that there's still four months and then comes the harvest. You know what? There's a lot of debate and everybody talks about this. And the older you get, the more you want what God, here's how it's going to be. You'll see, you'll see cataclysmic events happen in history and you go, wow, Jesus must be coming back. He must be coming back. When Hitler reigned on the earth and when ruled and reigned in, 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 in Europe, they thought he was the Antichrist. Came and went. 1988, I bought a book that said, why the rapture is going to happen in 1988. Didn't happen. Next year I had a book called Why the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1989. That's right. Because it didn't happen in 1988. That's right. I quit buying books. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't know when he's coming. That's right. But the more important thing is, listen please, you don't know how long you've got on this earth. You don't know. And I'm just saying, we all think we're going to live till we're old and you don't know. And I'm saying instead of pretending that we've got forever, why don't we live every day like he could be here any minute? And that when I reach this person, instead of looking past them because they're weird, you know what, I'm so thankful they didn't do that to me because I would never be saved today. I guess you would call I'm the ultimate out-of-the-box guy. And somebody prayed for me. And the reason they prayed for me, right. uh, because they prayed for me, I, Jesus introduced himself to That's me. That's right. That's right. Why are you here? 